So, Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to learn at your feet your precious and holy ancient word that is full of your life, your wisdom, and your power. We trust that you will grant once again that the tablet of our hearts gets to receive of virtue, of life, of wisdom, and of revelation from your word as we study Amen. together. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen. All right, glory to God. Welcome to How to Study the Bible, part two. Um, part one, I think we're about to round off saying that um, there's what we call hemeneutics, and that hemeneutics can simply be defined as the art and science of interpreting the Bible. Hemeneutics can be defined as the art and science of interpreting the Bible, that there is a way to interpret the Bible. And if we do not understand how to interpret the Bible, then we are going to misunderstand God. And when a man misunderstands God, you will misunderstand his intent in your situation and even in divine instructions. And then when you misunderstand God, after a while, your life begins to show how far gone one is in error. Sometimes the manifestation of one being in error takes a while. It's an angular shift. You know, when you draw a triangle or you draw two lines, the more angular shifts um, they possess, you may not quickly see it from the beginning, but the longer the lines go, the more obvious it becomes that there was an angular shift. And this is one of the things we are called to guard against as an apostolic people. We said that the Bible is God's thoughts in written documents. We said that scriptures are God's origin, original and only infallible revelation of himself, okay, and his saving activity for all people. You know, Jesus gave credence to the word of God. Um, if you look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 was saying, uh, For verily, verily, verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled and if you look at verse 17 just verse 17 jesus said think not that i am come to destroy the law or the prophets i have not come to destroy but to fulfill and you see the expression the law and the prophets when you hear the law and the prophets it's actually talking majorly about the entirety of the old testament so that means the old testament is a summation the Old Testament is a summation of the law and what? And the prophets. So it was not as if Christ's int intention was to abolish the Old Testament revelation. Rather, it was that he came to see it fulfilled. Are we together? So you see ethical laws, you see moral principles, you see civil laws, you see all those things were just manifestation of God's moral nature and his will for our lives. Okay, and most of which still apply even to this day. It's just the ceremonial law, okay, and the sacrificial system that are no longer binding. Are we together? So the law was a moral code. Okay, it was just like a moral code that the people lived by, especially those, actually, those who were in a saving relationship with God. You know, by obeying it, we get to express the life of Christ within us but faith in jesus christ is actually the point of departure for fulfilling the law why because through faith in christ god has become our father and is the lawgiver but we are now his children so that is where we begin from we begin from grace we begin from the ministry of the indwelling spirit who guides us into all truth now let's continue quickly Jesus spoke about, you know, the pivotality of the word and the word being, you know, God's 
revelation to us. If you consider John chapter 5, uh, verse 19. John chapter 5, verse 19. John 5, 19. Is somebody there? Answer Jesus okay. and said unto them, yeah. Very, very, I say unto you, mm. the son can do not of himself, but what is yet the father do, or what things ever he doeth, this also doeth the son like this. Is the son now, if you look at verse 30 and 31, you will see that the f- you will see the father's witness to the son. Yeah, please, what, what does he say in 30 and 31? I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, you see that? but the will of the Father which I send So me. when we want to discover the will of God, who do we look at? Jesus, yes. right? Yes. And in verse 31, he said, if I bear witness of myself, right? He said, my witness is not true. So even Jesus lived in dependence on who on the father so that means that when we come to scripture and we begin to behold christ in the word we are actually beholding somebody who decided to humble himself and yield to the will of the father now the reason i'm saying that is this go to john 7 16 in john 7 16 you will see jesus telling us clearly that which the word please John 7 16. Jesus answered them and said, Yeah, my doctrine is not mine. My it doctrine is, is not mine. Is that sent me. Now, verse 17, please. If any man will do his will, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. He shall know of the doctrine, whether, whether it be of God. Be of God. Uh-huh. I speak of so you see that there is this. The, the saving faith, the true, genuine saving faith, all right, and an experiential knowledge of Jesus' teaching require a desire in us to do the will of God. So you cannot really understand the word of God if your desire is not to do the will of God. Are we together? Because when we say how to study the Bible, it's not just to be some scholastic exercise. It's more than that. Is that I desire to do the will of God. This is why I am seeking knowledge of his will. He said, so you remember I told you in part one, all right, that to actually believe is to make a commitment to obey him. So here Jesus said, if any man will do his will, that means if any man wills to do his will, that means if any man desires to do his will, it is that one that will really come to revelation, that will come to the knowing of revelation. So we must come to the word with a heart that is willing to do that which is revealed. Are we together? Are we together? Yes. So that means that when you see Jesus, when you see the Lord speaking in the word, you are not just reading the words of a man. You are actually reading the words of God. John 8, 26. John chapter 8, verse 26. Jesus will come and tell you, I have many things. Uh-huh. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. Okay. But he who sent me is true. Mm. And I speak to the world those things which I had from him. You see that? So, Jesus says that the things he's telling us is actually hearing it from who? The Father. Are you, are you with me? So, if anybody comes to tell you otherwise, that means don't believe him. If anybody comes to tell you that the word of Jesus is not the word of God, don't believe him. And the reason Jesus is telling us these things is because of the other things that he's still going to say in scripture, even while in his earthly, during his earthly ministry. If you look at, um, if you look at, um, let's see, let's see a scripture. If you look at the book of, let's not do Luke, let's do Holy Spirit. Um, let's do Luke chapter 24, verse 25 and 27. Luke 24, 25 to 27. Yes, please. Them, yeah. All foolish ones. All foolish ones. And slow of us to believe in hope. Mm. That the promise that the prophets have spoken. Okay. 
Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Okay. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, he expounded unto them, them uh -huh, in, in all, all the scriptures. scriptures the things so here jesus is saying that notice he began with what and beginning at moses notice he didn't say <laughs> the bible eh? god is also he said beginning at moses from the beginning he said beginning at moses and all the prophets remember moses is actually if a, a representation all right theologically of the law when you hear Moses, you're talking about the law. That's why you hear when Moses is read, he's actually talking about the law. And then the prophets contain both the minor and the major prophet. So remember the scripture we first read that said the law and the prophets, right? So Jesus himself believed in the law and the prophet because he was the one that made the Holy Ghost inspire them to write and speak. You don't understand. This is the one they were talking about, now talking. So Jesus is not contradicting the law and the prophets is rather rather he is fulfilling the law and the prophets are we together yes. so if we despise or deny the full inspiration of scripture then we are denying jesus's witness as the one who was truly sent by the father to atone for the sins of man and then to die and rise again for our justification these understandings are very important if we will come into accurate biblical interpretation are we together yes, sir. is somebody with me now let's 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 just make some progress the word of god actually gives expression to the character of god and to the wisdom of god the word of god the bible gives expression to the character and wisdom of god that means that when, if you want to know who God is, look at Christ and look to the scriptures and wisdom. 2 Timothy 3.15 2 Timothy 3.15 The word gives expression to the character and the will of God. 2 Timothy 3.15 Please. Yes, please. Second Timothy three fifteen. And that from a child. And that from a child. Has known the Holy Scriptures. You see that? Which are able to make the wise unto salvation mm -hmm. through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Do you notice that? From a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which is able to make you what? Wise unto something. Salvation. Unto salvation. So th this is, it is the Holy Scriptures, okay? That understanding that helps you to become wise unto salvation. Because salvation is not really about man. It's about God's desire. God is the initiator of salvation. God is the originator of salvation. It was God that sent Jesus to die. It is God that gets glory for our salvation. It's God, God that gets glory for our redemption. It's God that gets glory for our justification. It's God that gets glory for our sanctity. He is actually it's about God and his saving activity. That's why it's the scriptures that make you wise unto salvation, not motivational books. The scripture. Are you with me? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, okay, we're in the temptation at the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. What the Bible says was that Jesus' response to his first temptation was, you know, when Satan said, Son of uh, Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Jesus answered and said, It is written. Notice that word. It is what? Written. He didn't say it is guessed. It is written. That means Jesus had a reference. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that what proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So here you, although here you see Jesus, you know, engaging the written word, okay, in overcoming temptation, we are also seeing that if you actually do not meditate day and night on the verses of scripture, okay, that you study and memorize it, you will not be able to quote these things when temptation comes. In fact, you cannot hide the word of God in your heart if you have not tried to hide them in your head. Are you with me? There is that place of wanting to memorize that now helps you in meditation. 
So somebody is facing a temptation. What memorized passage of scripture do you actually have? So that means that knowledge of the word helps you overcome temptations. Are you with me? Or let me say understanding and application of the word. The right understanding and what? Application of the word helps you to overcome temptation. Do you see that? This is why the word of God must be received. Have you read 2 Timothy 3.15? Yes. So the word of God must be received with meekness. Remember James 1.21. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The word engraft actually also means to memorize. Engraft your word. And you know when you want to graft in back Greek, you so memorize is in bite it. Are you with me? Yes, Imbibe it, receive it with meekness, believe it with faith, obey it cheerfully. In fact, there are times you don't feel like obeying, but you have to obey it. Why? Because the word of God was sent for our good. Are you with me? God gave us the word for our good. The word, you see, the Bible is not a body. It's only a body to those without understanding. The Bible is not a body. It's only a body to those without understanding. The See, this is all these things are still part of the condiments of studying the Bible and understanding the word. Okay, because the end point of understanding is what living. Remember, in part one, was it a uh, sorry? The was it the parable of the sower? Yes, the parable of the sower. That when you now understand, they say you turn. Remember, when I was teaching about repentance, the understanding of the word makes you to turn, turn from sin to God. All right, turn from unrighteousness to unrighteousness, turn from rebellion to serving the interest of the, you know, of the living God. Let the word of God be your final authority in all matters. That same 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Let the word of God be your final authority for reproof, for correction, edification, training, preparation. Let it be your standard. Yes, please. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Look at the word there. Profitable. The word profitable is a business language now. Huh? Profit means you transact with the aim to get... Ad- no, I, I'm defining profit. <laughs> it's with the aim of getting an additional fund. Or we can also say profit is adding more value. Or profit is making more impact. Okay? Profit, bringing glory to God is also part of profit in the kingdom. So you see that, yes, it's profitable. For doctrine. So all scripture, notice it didn't say New Testament only. Are you with me? It didn't say New Testament only. He didn't say the epistles only. He said all scripture. The word scripture is from the word graphe. It means all writing. All writing, all scripture, you know, you know, the scripture is, is what we call holy writ. It was written. It's a document. Are you with me? All scripture is, you know, from the by given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. Remember, I told you that doctrine is the word profitable. Are you with me? Is from the word ophelimus. Ophelimus or ophelimus means helpful or serviceable. Or advantageous. Just like Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. You see that? It's profitable. It's helpful. It's of advantage. That means that God gave us the Bible for our advantage. So when people try to twist the word of God, rather than it becoming an advantage for them, it becomes an advantage for the flesh, which leads to their greater disadvantage. Are you with me? But it is for our advantage. It is for us to make profit. I mean, for us to profit God. Are you with me? Yes. yes. And then, you know, it's profitable for doctrine. And I said doctrine from the word didascalia. It means teaching. Okay? It means precept. It means learning. It means instruction. 
Are you with me? And then he began to say, for reproof. And the word reproof actually means, you know, evidence. Somebody say evidence. evidence. You know, it, 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 it comes with a proof. You, you Imagine you're reading the book of Hebrews, for instance, or the book of Acts of the Apostles, just for instance. And you see what God did. You know, it, it gives you that proof. It forms conviction in you. It's like a science, you know, a scientist trying to test for the validity of something or litmus test, burex test for starch and protein, xanthoprotect test, you know, and these things like that. You put the test tube, you put, you know, the protein and then you add, you know, the leaf and all, um, the litmus paper and all that, you know, and then you begin to test and all these things. What happens is that when you're reading the word of God, the Bible was given so that you can prove those things. There's something we call proof text. So to confirm, you know, and that's how the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every truth shall be established. You confirm, you verify. So that as you verify, you are not just growing in knowledge, your conviction too is deepened. And then you are certain of that which you are learning. That's the word reproof. And then it says for correction. Look at that word. Correction means restoration. Are you with me? To an upright or light state. That means the word of God comes to correct our errors. No matter how great you are as a man of God, listen to me. There are still some errors that is the word of God that comes to correct it. You know what that means? That means there is great help for us in Christ. No matter how high you have gotten in your work with God or how far you seem to have gotten, there is a level you get to where sometimes it's difficult for people to actually correct you. This is why you have the Bible, that even in the privacy of your room, if you don't have people who can, you know, maybe you are surrounded by yes men, people who cannot tell you, bro, this thing is not accurate. This lifestyle is not balanced. Uh, God does not want this because now you are high and mighty and nobody can talk to you. In the privacy of your room, you can read the word of God and the word of God can point at you and say, this is wrong. And that's correction. Bring correction to you. Sometimes evil comes with strong rebuke. Why? To restore you to an upright or right state. Or another word for correction is improvement of life or character. Improvement of life. I love this. Listen, when the word of God is received with meekness and obeyed, it leads to improvement of lifestyle. You cannot interact with the word consistently and your life does not improve. I'm not talking of uh, quantity of the acquisition of material things, which are nice, which we need. But I'm talking about the quality of existence, the quality of your life, the impact of your life, the imprint, the branding that your life does even in the life of other people. The, The impact. Are you with me? It brings improvement of lifestyle and character. It straightens you up, you know, a reformation process, rectification process. It brings you back from error, you know, so that you can serve the interest and the will of God. And it says, for instruction in righteousness. Instruction has to do with what? Tutelage, right? To instruct, to tutor, education, right? to educate you, to child train you. So that means the word of God is our educative textbook. Is that correct? That means the word of God is our syllabus. No matter what you have read, the word of God is what? Is your syllabus. It brings disciplinary correction, chastening, instruction. You know, that, that the whole training, that education you do for children, and the goal is what? To cultivate their minds and morals so that they can fulfill a higher purpose. It comes to correct mistakes. It curbs our excesses. It cultivates our soul. Curbs our passions. There are some things we want to do because we are youth. and it curbs all those excesses. You know how, how you, you, want to put, uh, you want to plant cassava, for instance, and then you have to cut so that you can put some, you know, part of the, the stock, you know, in the ground and things. The word of God comes to chisu us so that we can become, you can carry the shape that can host the dimension of the grace and the power, the ability of God that he wants to reveal through us, even in our generation. If you are with me, say amen. amen. 
So there is nothing like um, I, I actually believe in Jesus and I love Jesus so much. Ooh, I believe in Jesus. And then you are not living by the word of God. There's nothing like I believe in Jesus and I hate Bible. Are you with me? You cannot submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ without submitting to his word as the ultimate authority. Are you with me? You cannot claim to submit to the Lordship of Christ and you do not submit to the word as the ultimate authority authority look at john chapter 8 verse 31 uh, it's quite you know it's a popular scripture john 8 especially 32 but 31 and 32 it's a very um instructive uh, verse of scripture john 8 31 and 32 jesus was talking then jesus said, jesus said which, which believed on him now, the word if is a conditional statement. Is that true? Yes. If you do what? Continue. continue. Now, did he say if you believe? He says if ye continue in my word. Uh -huh. So, what is the manual for discipleship according to, script, um, according to the Bible? What is our manual for discipleship? The word of God. This is the Bible. This is our discipleship manual. Are you with me? If ye continue in my word, the word continue actually means to remain in my word. The word continue means to abide. It means to tarry there, right? Yes. To be kept continually there. To control is like saying endure. You know how when you I don't know if you've had dogs before, puppies, and there's something they call tick. You know what ticks do? They stick. Ticks stick. Mm. Ticks, they stick, you know, to the body of the... And unless the dog uses the leg to push them off, or birds come to eat them off, maybe the body of the cow, or somebody removes it, or you use uh, dog tick powder, it's going to what? Abide. It's going to continue with that dog. In fact, some of them get very fat. And it can kill the dog. You know what? When you continue in the word, you cannot kill the word. Instead, the word cures the damage that the worldly system has done to your mind. Are you with me? To continue means to dwell, to tarry, to remain, to endure. He said if we continue in his word, then are we his disciples indeed. You know, sometimes when you hear the word disciple, sometimes it looks heavy. Hey, disciple, disciple, what's disciple? Disciple simply means a pupil right a student a learner he says you are my student indeed so that means when you are a serious bible student and you are trusting god for grace okay to continually apply what you are learning you are a disciple you are a student you are a pupil verse 32 now reads and ye that's awesome and ye shall know now the word know here is a very strategic powerful word it's from the word ginosko and it means to learn to know to get a knowledge of are you seeing that to get acquainted with there is the word you see one of the words for no okay according to the jewish custom is actually an idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman you that's what you will see the bible say and adam adam knew his wife Abraham knew his wife. To, that one is not, uh, give me your NIMC uh, card or ID card. Let me, what's your voter's card? Let me know you. No, that's not it. Uh, which state do you come from? This no means that level of intimacy where people have when they come into sexual intercourse. But he's saying that you come to this point where as you interact with the word, you are actually intercoursing with the truth. Are you with me? As you interact, as you fellowship with the word of God, you are making contact. Huh? You are intercoursing with the truth. Your spirit is continually mingling with the truth. Your soul is being washed by the truth. Are we together? 
Are you understanding now? As you allow yourself to become aware of, it, it gradually becomes your resolve. He says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's, you shall know verity. You will know what is right. You will know what is true in any manner, um, in any matter of consideration. That means there are some things that are actually correct, but does not make them truth. That something is correct does not make it truth. For instance, Ah, Anini was a wicked criminal. It is correct, but it does not make it truth. It is true, but it does not make it truth. Something can be true and is not the truth. It is true that the world is headed for an eternity without God. But the truth is if they repent, they will be saved. Do you see that now? So truth actually is God's stand on a matter. So that means you are not just looking for facts. You are other books inform the word of God transforms. Other books in form but the word of god does what it transforms us it transforms us that's why in verse 37 jesus rebuked them in john 8 he said i know that ye are abraham's seed but ye seek to kill me because my word has no place in you can you imagine can you imagine that jesus said his word doesn't have place in them because of what they intend to do. Are you following me? The truth sets us free. It grants us liberty. It brings us deliverance from slavery. But lies enslave us. The truth is redemptive. But lies are destructive. That means that if you claim that you receive something from the scripture. And it looks like truth. But is leading to your destruction. That means it is not the truth. It is a lie, even though it is laced with memory verse and Bible scripture, Bible passages to back it. Are you with me? <laughs> Are you with me, please? Okay. So, for instance, okay, let's 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 just continue. I said the other time in part one that when you come before the word of God, you should actually come with what meekness, a honest and a open attitude. And I have to emphasize it as simple as this thing looks, my friends. There are many people who the reason why they will not grow in their work with God and they will be busy with religion all through their Christian journey is because they are not honest and they are not open to the truth. Remember we just read John 8, 31, 32, and 37. The reason why they will not make progress is because they are not honest. So they read the word of God, but what they are looking for is hand-me-down ideas. Or they allow their denominational bias to cloud their understanding of a particular scripture. And they only read into it the meaning that they desire. Or they, only, they are only reading into it their personal needs. You know, and not what God is actually saying in that scripture. Maybe, for instance, the scripture says, Oh, I shall make you the head and not the tail. But then they, they don't call it like that. They say, I shall be the head and not the tail. The Bible doesn't say you shall be the head and not the tail. It says it will make you. That means there is a process. But unfortunately, people want benefits, but don't want to pay the price, the demands of the benefits that they desire. Are you with me? That's why I taught you the other day that there are two kinds of pleasure. There is the good player and there is the bad player. The good player is the one you pay the price before you enjoy it. The bad player is the one you pay the price after you enjoy it and so now let's continue understand please that your view of god affects your interpretation of scripture and your interpretation of scripture affects your view of god do you see they are interwoven your view of god affects your interpretation of scripture and the interpretation of scripture, your paradigm, your perspective also affects how you view God. So there are those who only see God as a tyrant and as a wicked warlord seeking to devour them at slightest provocation. And there are others who see God as a father Christmas and as a pet like a schizophrenic who really cannot get angry and does not have a will of his own. 
those two pictures are not the accurate portrait of the God of the Bible. God is a father, but he's still holy and he's still just and he's still righteous. He is all in all. Are you with me? Yes, sir. This is why we have to come open and with honesty and meekness. Because listen, when it comes to revelation, you must understand that there are two sides even amongst the faithful. For instance, even the book of Revelation, there are people who say they believe that um, the coming of Jesus Christ, the church would already be taken away before Jesus returns. There are those who believe, they call themselves the pre-tribulation rapture. There are those pre-tribulation, that's before the tribulation of course, the saints would have gone. There are those who say, no, there's nothing like pre-tribulation. We will all be here, go through the, you know, when you read the book of First Thessalonians and Revelation, we will go through it all, but if we overcome to the end, we will be saved. Although the issue is that, listen, any Christian who is afraid of persecution, of tribulation, and of death is actually revealing that he or she does, does not have enough depth in understanding that is or a life is already hid with Christ and Christ in God. That means even if I am absent in the body, I am present with the Lord. So whether we are still here when tribulation happens and the man of sin is revealed and all that, it still does not shake our faith. We will stand our ground and honor God, knowing fully well that we are secure in Him, even if there is trouble. That's the balance. That's the understanding. Not, oh God, I will not be here. Hey God, I don't. Whether you are here or not, what matters is that your allegiance is to God and you will live to honor Him. It is even better, I used to advise people, and I'm not, um, you know, imposing anything, but I advise people that it is better to actually expect that you will still be here when the Antichrist begins to work and when all these things are fulfilled and you have decided that in life and in death, you will honor God. So that, okay, if at all, I'm just saying, okay, by, that if at all, you all, we all now live even before that happens, you are still not at a loss. Rather than getting offended at God, if you didn't live before the man of sin is now revealed, the Antichrist now comes, and you didn't live, then you will see people departing from the faith and saying, look at that. See, JB, they said, the Bible said, we will live. You see that? That's what used to make for all kinds of escapist theology. That let's just escape. Let's just escape. And we don't want to do God's will even in the now. Are we together? But, um, well, that's it. So, so there are two sides. And, and guess what? There are people who believe we would live before, you know, the tribulation. And they believe it so much with their heart. And they are faithful. I've met some of them. And they are very faithful believers. They love Jesus. They love Jesus. They do evangelism. They love Jesus. Now, Jesus doesn't hate them. And Jesus will not crucify them for, you know, that. They are the other camp too. They are who love Jesus and are given to missionary enterprise. You see that? So, oftentimes... In different matters of doctrine, there are always two camps among God's people. Ah, this one's is either this one is saying, hey, it's like this. The other one says, that does not mean that we are not one body. But the more we are honest and open to the word, the more each person can also adjust when you find out that there is a superior revelation and truth and it is scripturally grounded and thorough. And then you'll be willing to succumb or submit and yield in that manner. Are we together, please? So, it's, it's very essential. And I taught you the other time that scriptures interpret scriptures. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 10, okay? Second Peter chapter 1 verse 20 to 23, okay? That scriptures interpret scriptures, okay? Upon precept, you see that? Yes, ma'am. Line upon line. You see that? Precept upon precept, line upon line, a little here and a little there. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 20 and 21. You know what the Bible says? Yes, please. Knowing, knowing this first. No, Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this first. Yes. Yeah, no prophecy, of, no prophecy of, of scripture is of what? Of any private is of any private now you have to underline that in your Bibles, please. That of any private, the reason why we have a lot of schisms, a lot of all kinds of things in the body today is because 
people are subjecting the scriptures to what? Private interpretation. And it's causing a lot, you can't even imagine, a lot of issues. A lot of issues. Okay? For prophecy never came by the will of man, mm. but only men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So you see that the the listen the, in verse 19 the bible actually tells us that we have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that he take it as unto a light that shineth in a dark place okay until the day dawn and the you know the day star arise um in your heart so we have a more sure word of prophecy number one that means that no humanistic ideas no secular humanism new age ideology and all these things that are coming up now is superior to the authority of the word of god are you with me Number two, this verse 19 attests the divine origin of scripture. You know, like I told you, that divine inspiration, okay? That it is God's infallible revelation and it is incapable of mistakes or misleading. The word of God will not mislead you. It is void of falsehood. It is free from error. It is free from deceit. Are you together with me now? You know, so very, very, and very trustworthy and reliable. Listen, friends, the word of God is reliable. No prophecy of scripture is of private interpretation. Now here, according to this context, it didn't come about by the writer's own idea, you get, or reasoning. But who gave it? The Holy Spirit. So it's not as if the writer's idea, that's private interpretation. Now that the writer's idea, I just feel like, let me just write about uh, the Romans. And let me just write about, no, that's not what happens. It's not the writer's idea now. He's saying what? The Holy, even if a writer said, this is my idea, it's actually the Holy Spirit using him to get something across. Are you with me, please? Very, very essential. Now verse 21, please. Prophecy. Somebody say prophecy. So when somebody begins to prophesy, maybe I lay hands on you now. You begin to prophesy. Now that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that what you are saying is superior to the authority of Scripture. Because while prophesying, there is the our humanity. Having said, you know, maybe you've prophesied accurately, and then in the last two lines of your prophecy, you can add flesh to it and say, well, and then mm, now um, you should also send uh, two thousand. To my account as an offering for thanksgiving. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And that's all. Now, although some of the things you might have said might be correct, but where you added flesh, the word of God comes to judge it. Yes. Or then I say, okay, now, 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 don't marry that lady again. Marry my cousin because, because, because. Mm. <laughs> or, ah, now you have to go rob a bank because this money we must use it to preach the gospel. Those things are not accurate. Why? Because the prophecy came in, old, not in old time, by the will of man. It's not, it's not your will. You are not putting your will to do the prophecy. You get, you, you allow God to, it, it is God that inspires prophecy. Because you are trying to communicate his will to somebody else. I don't, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. This is not tongues where you yield your, you know, your will and say, Holy Spirit, I, al- I align with you, I allow myself. Prophecy, the Spirit of God comes on you and then you begin to utter. Right? Hmm. Very, very important because <laughs> the reason why, okay, verse 21 says, all time, you know, the will of men, but holy men of God, notice that word, holy, men of God speak as they were moved. He didn't say speak as they were moved by the economy. He didn't say speak as they were moved by the circumstances. He said they moved by the Holy, that means to really function accurately in the prophetic, you need to have a genuine relationship with Christ and his word. You must know your Bible. And then it is as the spirit moves you that you speak, not as circumstance moves you, not as your pocket moves you or as your belly moves you or that your eyes move you that you now speak. Are you with me? So, men of God spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this is why believers, you and I, must maintain that solid, what did I call it? Somebody say solid. Solid, Solid, uncompromising view of the Holy Scriptures. Somebody was telling me, oh, um, you know that even the Bible says it's not complete. There are other things they remove from the Bible. I said, no, sir. I don't agree. 
while we've read, you know, all kinds of, you know, while in our quest, you know, trying to seek revelation, we've read all these all funny books. I'm not going to mention their names so that I don't make them more popular. All kinds of extra biblical materials and all that. But I found out that God has decided that this one, this compendium, all right, is safe for us. I'm not saying they are not that, but this one, he said it's safe for us. You hear some books or you need this one, you know, this one is safe for us. So we must maintain a solid, uncompromising view of the Holy Scriptures as inspired by God or as given by the Holy Spirit. It has to be our mindset. We have to believe this because without a solid view of the Holy Scriptures, number one, we will lack a foundation to build on. Number two, there will be no faith that endures to the end. Number three, there will be no certainty of our salvation. Number four, there will be no moral absolutes. That means this mother is a sin, mother is a sin. Then tomorrow is, well, since we don't hold the Bible very seriously, well, mother is not a sin again. His mother is nice. Or abortion is a sin. And they say, no, abortion is not really a sin. Sometimes it can be just, abortion is not a sin. Killing, you know, and all these things, fornication and adultery, they are not really sins. It depends on your mood and your feelings and your emotions. If we don't have a strong, solid, uncompromising view of the scriptures, all right, of the Holy Scripture, one, we don't have a solid foundation. Two, we don't have a faith that endures. Three, there is no certainty of our salvation, right? Four, there are no moral absolutes. Five, there is no message to preach without doubt. That means even we are not sure of what we believe. Six, there is no sure expectancy for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Eh? We cannot be sure whether Holy Spirit will baptize us or Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Ghost because we are not even sure. We, we are not even point. Is that six now? So number seven, we are not even sure of our redemption and we are not sure whether we will resurrect and reign with Christ. Are you with me now? We are not even sure whether there is hope that Christ will even return at all. And that's very dangerous. Without a strong view of the Holy Scriptures, we cannot contend for the faith. We cannot withstand the extreme difficulties that will, you know, come against us in the last days. I think you see that in 2 Timothy uh, 3, 1 and um, 1 Timothy 4, 1. That the Spirit, Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times men shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, you know, doctrines of devils. That demons too actually are, they teach doctrines too. Are you with me? Remember, I said doctrines are teachings. Demons don't enter lives just because the person slept under a palm tree or banana tree. No, demons <laughs> actually walk through what doctrines. He says doctrines of devils. That's what leads to the seduction of many doctrines of devils. So it's not only pastors that teach devils also what teach and how do they teach they enter men to inspire men against the will and the ordinance of god as revealed in scripture are we together without a solid view of the holy scripture all right the full authority and the teaching of the bible becomes weak that means we can replace the bible with our personal experiences all right and then or by independent, you know, critical reasoning, somebody just comes and says, see, forget about that thing. The Bible, I had this experience, it's deeper than what the Bible is saying. Um, you know, what I believe is greater than what the Bible is saying. Let's forget about the Bible for now. Keep the Bible aside. Young ladies, you want to enter a relationship and the brother is always telling, see, for now, forget Bible every time. Or you have friends, see, let's keep the Bible, Bible apart. Let's talk, or Christianity aside. My friend, we can't be friends. We can't even be friends. Uh, keep the Bible keep, but if you keep the Bible aside, you are keeping Christ aside. Let's forget Christianity aside first. Yeah, I'm a Christian. That means what you are saying is me aside, me, Christ, the Holy Ghost, redemption, everybody aside. Don't keep it aside. Are you with me? Mm. Are we making progress? So 
it's very essential because the you know the scripture is also like i said an historical document right history is actually essential to everything okay you see the sojourn of the children of israel you know the exodus journey which is actually like a type of the church okay living you know sin satan and bondage and then being emancipated and delivered you know into a land flowing with milk and um honey but let's continue you know that the bible was written by you know about 40 authors over the span of 1500 years at least you know that range okay and how many books does the bible have oh that's beautiful how many in the old testament and how many in the new testament do you have an idea (laughs) Okay, which is more than which Old Testament or New Testament? Okay. Okay, so go and do the assignment. How many books do we have in the Old Testament, right? And how many books do we have in what? In the New Testament. Now, let's make progress. Who is the author of the Bible? From the things I've been teaching you by now, you should at least know who the author of the Bible is. So, who is the author of the Bible? God. Who is the author of the Bible? The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. According to, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16, that holy men wrote and speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, the Spirit of God is the author of the Bible. And 2 Peter 1, you know, 20-21, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Now, that's very striking. If the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, to know the Bible, who should you look for? Who should you relate with? Holy Spirit. Mm. That's why when I'm studying the Bible and I ask him, Holy Spirit, teach me, teach me, teach me. Listen, the Holy Spirit is attracted to make people. He's attracted to teachable people. He's attracted to humble people. Jesus was God, right? As though he were man because he was fully God and fully man on it. And he was God. He was God as though he were man and he was man as though he was God. Why? Because he had the spirit of God without male. Are you with me? Now, I agree that we all have, you know, our theological bias. We don't often quickly yield to a contrary view. You know, if somebody challenges your belief, maybe there's something you believe now and I'm teaching. And, you know, you, you, it's because it is against or opposes your bias. Okay. It's not easy to quickly adapt to it. But what matters is, do we really want the truth or we want to maintain our own personal convictions? I would rather lay down my convictions so that I can walk in truth. What we are looking for in the last days is accurate believers. Accurate believers. So as we approach the word of God and the spirit of God begins to bring revelation, we need to come to that point where we depend on him. Now, depending on the Holy Spirit does not mean not studying. It doesn't mean not consulting other, you know, study Bibles and materials. You know, when you're talking about study Bibles, um, I remember when I began Life Application Study Bible. That's a New Living Translation, NLT. Uh, Life in the Spirit Study Bible. That's a KJV. Uh, Christian Basic Study Bible. Dick Annotated Study Bible. I mean, we just have study Bibles like that. You know, I look I look at their comments, okay? What do they have to say about this subject? Okay, so that I can have a good grasp of it, okay? So that I know, understand the boundary, you know, with which I can, you know, sp- sp- you know, uh, spread an ideology, okay? Or stretch an ideology. And then another thing is after, you know, looking at their perspectives and all, I'm also asking the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, take me deeper. Show me something. So there are many things in Scripture that I found out that commentaries may not contain but the commentator himself the commentator the one that wrote it himself he will now expand it in my understanding are we together but study bibles just help you know guide and that's why if you also have a bad study bible it's dangerous because there are some study bibles that somebody can because of their own denominational and write something there 
and then you believe it because maybe it's also part of the Bible. Are you learning something? Yes, so, so that uh, we don't get carried away by somebody imposing their culture on us. It has to be the word and the word only. Okay? So, but it's good that you also... Now, the other extreme is, oh, because I'm trusting the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to study any other documents. I'm not going to study any other... I mean, I'm not studying other Bible translations. I'm not reading what other authors wrote. I'm not reading Christian books. There are some ministers that I fear the most. One of the ministers I fear the most are ministers who decide not to read any Christian literature. They just have just their Bible and maybe one Jotan 8. That's the only thing they read. And it's not that they cannot read. Okay? They just don't want to read. They feel, ah, all those writers, they are writing because they want to make money. But God set teachers in the body to expound to us the way of the Lord more excellently like Aquila and Priscilla. If Aquila and Priscilla already wrote a book and Apollos read it, he would have been better off before they came. Do you see that? But, you know, iron sharpened iron. Let's not get to that point where we are so pride, proud we can't read all the works of others. We learn. You know, many many fathers of the faith will tell you that one of the authors that blessed you know them so much in their work with the Lord is um uh, you know the late Reverend Kenneth E. Again. Kenneth E. Again, uh, E. W. Kenyon, A. W. Toza, Watchman Nee, Norman Gessler, Ravi Zacharias, you know, different authors like that. Charles Swindoll, Chuck Swindoll, you know, learning and and getting, you know, sharpened. So it's good that while you are trusting the Holy Spirit, get knowledge of the cultural and the historical context of the passage. Remember, in part one, I said this also, so that you can grasp it more clearly, so that you can know what he's talking about, so that you don't get bamboozled by somebody bringing their own idea just to make sure that, you know, you are, you buy into their idea. We'll all have our cultural bias. We mix theology with culture. Ah, skirts and trousers here and there. But you see, meanings are not in the words. They are in people. That's where the danger of interpretation, interpreting scripture is. Meanings are not in the words themselves. They are in people. It's people that put meaning and, you know, when they read, they can say, oh, Esther waited two days. Somebody can bring it teaching out and say the power of waiting wait for two days now the the scripture is on its own there meaning that's why if we do not give ourselves to an accurate study and understanding of the scriptures the more we keep putting our own meaning in the word the more we are losing losing that potency that that you know the purity and the potency of that word the more we are weakening it in our lives now there are two divisions to hermeneutics 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 we have said is the art and science of what interpreting the bible very good so a we have what it meant what it meant usually is what it means i don't know if you understand what i meant by mean by that what it meant usually is what it means. That means what it meant then is what it means now. If that scripture meant it is more blessed to give than to receive then, what it means now is still, is still more blessed to give that. See, time can pass, but the word of God abides forever you can't you can't bring your new modernization to now change it that it doesn't mean that what it meant then is what obedience is better than sacrifice and working than the fat of ram what it meant then is what it means even now that's why as we study the scripture what should we do we should seek to get at the meaning of the text how do you get this done by close examination to the grammar now, I tell people, people say, well, because I studied the Bible, I just pray in tongues. I pray in tongues and then that's all. It's not, it's not all, sir. Some of us needed to go and get brighter grammar. You know brighter grammar? You don't know brighter grammar? I do. Ah, we laughing. You know it's book one, book two, book three, book. You know it's not one. Yes. Mm-hmm, it's in series. So that we can understand. In fact, dictionary. Apart from Bible dictionary, other dictionary, so that we can understand. And then Greek and Hebrew lexicon. Let's understand it from the root. 
Yes, thank God there's eSword, my sword, and all these things on phones. But beyond that, you know, you keep searching like a student, like an archaeologist. You want to find out. You need something authentic. You don't want to get deceived. Okay? Close examination to the grammatical construct or the grammar and the plain meaning written in that context, within that context. The plain meaning simply means when you look at the entire context, what is he actually driving at? Okay? Before you now spiritualize it and spooky, spookylize it, look for the plain meaning within the context. What, are, what, what is it actually talking about? Aha! Uh-huh. It's from that place that you can build. Not putting, you know, something strange inside it and say, mm, I got a revelation. Mm, I got a revelation. Mm. You know, it's all those things. Some of them are flesh. We just want people to, we want to say something that is not scriptural so that we can feel like we have more authority over, we don't have more authority than scripture. What, or your, we derive our authority from our interaction with scripture, our be aligning with what is scripture. The scripture is our ultimate, you know, authority for truth and verity. It's our ultimate guide. Are you with me? Because the spirit is one that inspired it. So it doesn't, it's not contradicting Holy Ghost. B is the new style. The new style is what the text means. Is still what it means. What it meant usually is what it means. That's one. B now is what the text means. Is still what it means. Now, but here in the new style, okay, what the text means, we are trying to consider how does the text apply today? Do you see that? How does the text apply today? Men with men doing things that are not convenient. It looks KJV. What do you mean by men with men doing Romans chapter? What are you talking about? And then you may not see it in the Bible written homosexuality, lesbianism, women and women doing things that are inconvenient gay and all these things you may not see it there but when you now look at our times you actually find out that that scripture is actually talking about these things how does it apply to what our how does that text apply to us today how do you you know bridge the gap between two cultures look at the time it, the scripture was written look at our own time now things are fast changing but the word of God does not change. But are there fresh insights that that same word still up is still relevant to? You know, there's a way some people make the word of God feel it's just Old Testament, Old School, Cargo. It doesn't apply to us today because God doesn't know what we are going through now. We, we are the millennials. The Bible doesn't understand us. No, sir. The Bible understands you. It's the person teaching you that may not know how to bring, okay, fresh perspective and still be what God would have wanted you. All right? To understand, are you are you together? For instance, now foot washing. Now, when people say, "Oh, they got a personal revelation from Scripture and they make a doctrine out of it and all that," well, but you see, foot washing according to Scripture, just for instance, now you know I'm talking about cultural gap. The, if you look at the context of the Scripture of foot washing, look at what foot washing was about. It Jesus was yes, fine, yes, talking about humility, okay. That okay, you know the disciple washing the foot of the uh, the disciples in ancient times, in their own days, the humidity, the humidity, the temperature, the the it was so it was not very hot. That's why you see them in robes and in fact you know just like it's just like let's just say Agbada for instance. You know you have space within. That can still allow, you know, air letting and all, you know, all that. Why? Have you seen Chinese film before too? You see them wearing all these things. Yes. Then you now want to replicate it in Nigeria and tie all your face and tie. Eh. Look at that. So, those, that dress, for instance. So, when you see the priest, everybody, eh, look how the priests are dressing. That means you should be dressing like that today. You are not interpreting that scripture. That's not what that scripture meant. God didn't say everybody start wearing white clothes and yellow something all around. That's... I don't know if you get what I'm saying. This is not to, you know, uh, speak against. I'm just letting you understand what Bible, what says in all fairness and sincerity. 
The average person when walking in the days of Jesus, they had a lot of cattle and all that. There were animal dungs here and there, okay? The road and all that, dust everywhere. But it was a, you know, a desert region. Dust everywhere. You don't just, uh, when you enter the house, what happens was that it was the servant that will come, okay, take water, you know, clean your leg, wash it, wash your sandal and all that. It was, you know, just like a courtesy to your guests, you know, your servant come and wash their legs and all that. That's what it was for. We don't need to bring 20 steps to foot washing out of it. Are you with me? Or revelation out of it. If you want to apply it in modern day context, it should be shoe polishing. You get ah welcome welcome hey please please help, help shine the shoe please ah you know they came with ah please help them shine the shoe the road is dusty and all that eh uh-huh. or sending Uber to take them to and fro you know honoring your guests eh uh-huh. not I mean foot washing and all that robes mainly was for weather not just for holiness it was only the priests and it was there were symbolism to it the white the color. All right, their forehead, holiness unto the Lord, the stones and all that. It's not, it's not that. That's not what Jesus should not be doing now. So that means I wear jeans now. That means I'm never man. We wear jeans and canvas. Ah, this one's never man of God. Hey, see the way. Uh, men of God don't wear jeans. Okay, so maybe men of God just wear uh, shark, shark, apple, sack. You know. <laughs> May the Lord show us mercy. It's all those things. There is nothing now. There is nothing in as is gene now. What this is a fabric. Gin is a fabric. Pant trousers, fabric. Uh, wool, fabric. Is what the Bible teaches about dressing is moderation. You see that not okay. Gin according to the Bible is not yes, sir. This is now now if it exposes all right sensitive body parts it doesn't make sense yes. all right what should you do as a mature person or as somebody that is even morally even the average moral folks who don't even know Jesus they will not expose their body anyhow do yes. you get but you have eternal life in you you won't just expose your body anyhow but that does not make a dress I mean <laughs> may the Lord show us mercy Amen. okay for instance now you want to take the Bible literally you now you now go and um, so I was saying that you see that washing of feet and all that. Feet washing is not to bring healing, a miracle. That the Bible that's not Bible. Are you listening to me? Yes. Not argue. I'm just telling you what. There is no revelation. There is no scripture. I, I told you scripture interpret scripture. There is no scripture that corroborates that one. That when Jesus washed the leg of that old lady, and then she was healed. There's no way like that. It's not feet washing. How many times did, did, did Jesus wash feet in Bible? Are you with me? When Peter said, ah, don't wash me, don't wash me. He just said, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. In fact, <laughs> they, were, they wanted to eat. They wanted to take meal. You didn't let me wash you. You can't eat out of this food. <laughs> you will start. Not, ah, what? <laughs> it's not, uh, we just make all these things, uh, you know. Or greet one another with a holy kiss. When you see that in Bible, you say, eh, ah, let me take it literally. You see now, written, and then where well, I've heard some people say that there are some groups that some judges in court that say, ah, greet, greet one another with the holy kiss, then you just, mm, <laughs> oh God, let us be guided. <laughs> you are not with me, you are, you are not, are you with me? <laughs> Listen, greet one another with the holy kiss. You need to understand the cultural context over there. As a, and the time it was being written, when they greeted themselves, you know, in some parts of the world, they still do holy kiss. I mean, even though people are not even Christian now, let's talk about people who are not Christian. They, when you go to some, you know, posh places or civilized places or other parts of the world, especially, you know, Europe, and when they want to greet themselves, some of them just, you know, peck one another to the right and to the left. This man will peck your wife, that one will peck your own wife too. And then you, you and the man, you just shake yourself and just walk away. Now, that was the context. What he was saying, if you want to apply it now, it doesn't mean boys go and you you and the girl just for two minutes. Like, mm, holy kiss. May you, madam, your man. <laughs> you are not with me. You are not. Are you? Are you? <laughs> ah, jeez. If that's it, all of us will be going to church now. Everybody will be going to church for holy kiss. They say, Pastor, yeah, now the let's. Ties they say, we don't gonna stand near one busy village. Give and they say, Sister Alpha, oh yeah, yeah, now they say, should be and say, holy kiss. That's error. That's not what are you, are you learning something now? That's how people take scripture and bring it to you know. That's the, the that's not the context. Now, if you are saying greet one another with a holy kiss, 
in our context here now, you're saying, oh, maybe Max, maybe, you know, hug yourselves or sh at least shake yourselves. You know, hey, 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 brother, you don't celebrate yourselves and just be happy, greet yourself, courtesy and all that. Not, it has to be that Bible say kiss, Bible say kiss, follow Bible to the letter. The letter killet is the spirit that gives life. Are you with me? Okay, let's continue. Other methods of interpreting scripture as we prepare to pray. Uh, we still have to go with part three and maybe part four depends. But I believe that this has already given you a robust framework to be able to work with. In some of my books, I've you know, done teachings on these things. Are you with me? Yes, sir. All right. So, Just like the matter of the covering of hair too. I See, listen, if you want to cover your hair, if I'm in your meeting or you, you cover your, I won't fight you for it. No, no, no. Listen, in, under the New Testament, what we call kingdom is actually the Holy Spirit's influence governing the person's life. Are you with me? So for you, if the Holy Ghost is your own dealing, don't do this. Then don't do it. Are you with me? So I won't come and say everybody you must cover your hair or everybody don't cover your hair. Mm -mm, the two are extremes. That's not what the Bible teaches. For moderation. If you say, okay, this is what we want to do. And you guys agree as a church that, okay, oh, we want our workers to be covering their hair and their chest because of this and that and that and that. Well, you people agree to do it and you're doing it. <clears throat> but not that everybody must. That means if you don't cover your hair, you cannot enter our church. If you don't, these things, these things are going to chase people away from the kingdom. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. I'm not saying become lax and loose, but I'm saying, listen, Covering of air in that scripture is talking about authority. Authority. Submission to authority. Listen, man, the reason why man does not, does not need to cover air in church actually is because, listen, man already has a covering. The head of the man is Christ. Are you with me? Christ is the head. Please say with me. Christ, Christ. is the head of the man. Christ is the head of the man. Of the man, so, somebody's not with me. Say, Christ, Christ is the head, is the head of, the man. of the man. So you see that the head of the man is Christ. The head of the woman is who? Is the man. This is this is what uh, Scripture teaches. Not our new new uh, philosophies. Are you with me? If you look at First Corinthians eleven, a man in verse seven, a man. Okay, if you look at verse five, well, I don't want to dive deviate too much on this because you know our teaching and all that. If you look at verse three, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Do you see that? And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Verse 5, but every woman, look at this, that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, hear this. For a man, verse 7, indeed ought not to cover his head. For So, he's talking about real head. As much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Do you see that? So, the woman, you see, the man, the God is the glory of the man, the head of the man. The woman is the glory. So, in answer for this court, ought the woman to have power over her head. Look at the word, power over her head because of the angels. He uses the word power over her head. That's authority over her head. That's verse 10. He didn't say scarf. Look at verse 10, sir. Ma, what did he say? Verse 10, 1 Corinthians 11 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Do you see that? Did he say scarf? Did... <laughs> leave that in. Leave that in. Hey, come back here. Let's are, are you not with me? Are you with me? Yes, sir. It's not. Now, does that mean does that mean if you maybe you are used to covering your head and sh sh I mean does that no? I'm just saying that. Mm -mm. It's not that if you don't cover your head, then God will hate you. you all right? You'll be in danger of hell and no, no, please. Other methods of interpreting the scripture so that we can pray for this session and close. Write this, please. Number one, allegory. 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 That's bypassing the literal words for a deeper spiritual meaning. 
allegory. Did you people do figures of speech in literature? All right. So you must have heard of allegory, oxymoron, irony. Okay. By passing the literal words for a deeper meaning. Now, Augustine, let me give you an example. I don't think you may want to write this because um, it's quite lengthy. But, well, if you are fast like me, it depends. Allegory, St. Augustine gave an allegorical interpretation of the story of the Good Samaritan. How many of you have heard of the story of Good Samaritan? Have you heard of the Good Samaritan? You know we call it Good Samaritan. Bible actually says Samaritan. But, of course, we know Good Samaritan. That's where you will see in the book of Luke chapter 10. Okay? Luke chapter 10, you will see the story of the Samaritan who had compassion, you know, on the man that was stripped of all that he had. Okay, so, now, if you read that scripture, because of our time, alright, all right, you are going to see how that the priest, the Levites, you know, everybody were busy, carried away with their own religious activities, and only the Samaritan. Actually, Samaritans have a long-standing, uh, uh, have a long-standing, you know, rift with the Jews in the sense that they were con- the, G- the Jews considered the Samaritans as a race that God actually wanted to wipe off, just like the Moabites. You know, Ruth was a Moab- Moabites. All right, so the 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 Jews cons- the average Jew looked at the Samaritan as an outcast, somebody who is not even worthy to be alive, somebody who is not even worthy to receive, all right, favor from God or help from God. I mean, it was that bad. That's the Samaritan for you. That's why, in fact, if the average Jew had their way and they were passing in the territory where the Samaritans are, rather than maybe it would take them, let's say, 20 minutes to walk through the Samaritan region and another place would take them two hours, the average Jew would prefer to go and walk two hours so that they wouldn't even breathe the air. I mean, it was that bad. That's why in John 4, when the Bible says, and, you know, he must need to go through Samaria, and Jesus met the Samaritan woman. <sighs> You know, it was it was a shock because the woman said, but the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. I mean, it was that it was that serious. Okay. But um in in this story, it was the Samaritan that went to help him, you know, healed his wound and all that. And Jesus ended by saying, He that showed mercy on him, you know, and that um, you to go and do likewise, show mercy unto others. Now, in that allegory, you are going to see. A certain man, now this is Augustine, it's not mine, okay? St. Augustine. A certain man here is Adam. He's trying to give us a picture of salvation, sort of, using this passage. A certain man, because the scripture says here, a certain man. So a certain man, according to this scripture, okay, maybe it will do well for you if I just briefly read it. um, Because of those that may be listening to us today. Now, Luke chapter 10, I'll begin reading from verse 30, because of time, verse 30. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, notice a certain man, okay, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he had departed, he took out two pence 
and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? Okay, so Jesus was teaching about, uh, you know, love, mercy, and all that here. So, in St. Augustine's allegory here, what we see is, a Samaritan woman, a Samaritan, um, sorry, a certain man is Adam. That was the certain man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So in the allegory, Adam is the certain man. Jerusalem is the heavenly city of peace from which Adam fell. Remember, Jericho re- signifies the moon, signifying Adam's mortality. Thieves, the devil and his angels, stripped him of his immortality beat him that's persuading him to sin left him half dead that's he died spiritually but he's still alive physically thus he is half dead okay the priest and the levites consist of the priesthood and the ministry of the old testament because the law enlightened but it did not empower you the law showed you what was wrong but it did not empower you to do what was right are you still with me now all right the samaritan rep- represents christ bound his wounds that's binding the restraint of sin Poured oil, that's comfort of good hope. Wine, exhortation to walk with a fervent spirit. Beast, that's the flesh of Christ's incarnation. And in, that's the church where it was taken care of. The morrow, that's after the resurrection. Two pens, that's promise of this life and the life that is to come. The innkeeper, that's you know, the servants of God or Paul the Apostle. Then, so, these kinds of interpretation plays around with, you know, coincidences of words, of numbers, and then situations. So, that's allegorical, you know, method of interpretation. But we must be careful so that we don't make, you know, this was just a picture, just like you're an evangelist and you're trying to give a picture or illustrate what's happened, but it must still be rooted in scripture and does not contradict the character of those that you are using. So, number two is typology. It's called the principle of types. Types and typology. In my book, um, Contending for the Faith, I already explained um, some of these things. Types and typology. Principles of biblical interpretation. Types and typology. Similar to allegory, while taking seriously the literal meaning as well. So, for example, this one is actually taking seriously the literal meaning. Now, and I'm going to explain it, maybe you know, just expand it a little. Now, if you consider... The flood of Noah. Do you remember flo- flood of? You know we used to call it the flood of <laughs> the ark of Noah. The flood of Noah. Is it Noah's flood? Okay. The flood represents what? A type of the world under universal judgment. That's what we call type. A type. That's or what we, you know. There's difference between type and archetype. You know, like is is like a skeleton of something. Let me give an instance. The rod of Moses that was um lifted in the wilderness that as many who look to it they lift that was a type of the christ that is to come the son of man if you will lift up the son of man he will draw men unto himself they will look to him they will be lightened and their face will not be ashamed because when they look to that brazen serpent what happened they didn't die anymore they weren't beaten by the serpent anymore when you look to the christ who has bruised the head of the serpent are you saying now that's what we call type joseph was a type of christ i'm just giving examples Joseph was a type of Christ. Why? He was betrayed by his own. You see that? He was sent out. He was in the pit. And then, you know, he was coronated. But guess what? He still reconciled, right? And forgave his brothers and brought them back. Joseph was a type of Christ. Joshua was a type of Christ, leading the people of God out of captivity. Are you with me now? So the flood represents a type of the world under universal judgment. And if you look at Noah, God chose one man. That's Noah too was a type of Christ, you know, in a sense. Because God chose one man to be a savior. Are you with me? If you believe, how did you how would you be saved in the times of Noah? You have to believe in order to enter the ark and be saved from the flood. Do you see that? So that's what we call principle of types and typology. A type is a picture. You know, most times you see it in the Old Testament and then you now go to see the manifestation in the New Testament. It's called types. Right? So number three is um, exegesis. Exegesis. Number three now 
E X E G E S I S Exegesis. Exegesis means okay, bringing out the basic meaning of a text. All right, the basic meaning. That is what it meant originally. Now, exeg. Now, this was what this was the argument of um, Luther. That's the reformers, the Protestant reformers in their days. Okay, Luther and John Calvin. Okay, they actually rejected the allegorization that they would, um, you know, that uh, Augustine was bringing, you know, interpreting the Bible. But they said exegesis is what does it mean originally. That's what you know you should stick with. Exegesis is, however, different from exposition, but you know, still in that vein, all right, under still under the umbrella. Exposition is bringing in the teaching or the significance of the text. Are you with me? Bringing in what the teaching or the significance of the text. So, so what do we learn, all right? From the text after the whole, what do we learn from it? Then, apart from exegesis and exposition, under it we now have application. How does this teaching apply to life at present? All right, or how does it apply to my personal life? There are a lot of people who read the Bible and all they just do is they just want to prove a point, or they even come in what we call isogesis and exegesis bringing what they want as scripture and wanting to run it down the truth of other people application how does it apply to me okay what can i learn from it and what can i do with it exegesis seeks to you know explain explain in a way that at least should be quite satisfactory explain in a way that should be quite satisfactory are we together so there are principles you know for you know, Bible interpretation, okay? And what, what are principles? Principles are, you know, is a, a principle is a set law, all right? An established way of doing things. That's what a principle is. It's what a set law, an established way of doing things. So there are principles for doing things. And why do we need principles of Bible interpretation? We need it because they protect us from being misled and misleading others. Are you with me? Yes, sir. That's why Paul told Timothy. He said if you give it to doctrine properly, what you are going to do is that the end point that you really gave it to doctrine is that you are going to save yourself and you will be able to save those who hear you. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself, okay, thyself, and then unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing these, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Are you with me? So, there is the place of principles. They help you to not be misled and then to not mislead others. So, principles are statements of procedure. So, no one is infallible. With any subject, on any theological subject, that means nobody is, has it all. That there's nothing more to learn. Okay, there's nothing no more to know. But at least we all can have a framework, and this is our framework. This is what we are going to work with. This is the you know the boundaries of our operation within the context of the scriptures as it relates to this particular subject, and then anything contrary to it, then we now begin to refute it. Okay? So it's also good that we consider the language. Remember, the language, Hebrew. I told you that the scriptures is sem Semitic, Hebrew, Aramaic, and the Greek. In fact, God is so awesome that he actually waited for the Greek to already you know begin to exist before he now sent christ to come in person because the new testament is written in the greek so that there is no ambiguity or confusion as to oh, old testament said this and that and that the greek the greek has a way of giving you a rich 
all right, in-depth perspective. So God waited. <laughs> Are you with me? For instance, if you look at the word love, English does not capture the word love properly. Remember, I wrote in my book, Equip, love in context, right? Did you read that chapter? Did you read it? Yes. All right. So you are going to notice that um, the word love in English, I mean, a man can say, I love my wife. And the next minute he says, I love my puppy too. And I love Indomie. And I love basketball. And I love carries. You know, and I love... I even love my suit. You see that? All those things. The English does not show you the full weight of that word. But when you go to the Greek and the Hebrew, for instance, you're going to see the word philio, eros, agape. You see that? Philio. All right. For instance, when the Bible says, let brotherly love, you know, continue. The word brotherly love there, the word brotherly love there is Philadelphia. Philadelphia, that's what it means. Brotherly love, Philadelphia. Eros has to do with, you know, eroticism, erotic love, that sensual feeling, that, you know, that's not Jesus' main kind of love. Huh? Agape, the love of Christ, selfless love. You see that? Yielded himself unconditionally on the cross. You see that? That's why we're yet seen as Christ died for us. Do, do, do you get that? So, it is very important to understand Bible interpretation because meaning influences your thinking and your thinking influences your living. Proverbs 23, 7, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If that means if your thinking is wrong, your life will be wrong. It's just a matter of time. Are you with me? If you don't believe that there is no heaven and there is no hell, <laughs> You don't believe that there's heaven. You don't believe there's hell, for instance. Ah, it's going to affect your lifestyle. You'll be wayward. Why? If, even if you say I'm a moral person, but I don't believe in heaven and hell, it's just a matter of time. Under the circumstances that should bring to light the error of your belief, you will see that even you yourself will falter. I remember Thomas Hobbes in defining uh, uh, state and all that, while elements of government and state while we're on campus. He said, you know, might is right. That life was chaotic, nasty, brutish. I said, what kind of a definition is this? Ah, ah. You know? Well, Thomas Hobbes was not a Christian. So, uh, with his thinking that made him see everything like dog eats dog kind of, uh, kind of lifestyle. So, this is why we need to be careful as we interpret scripture because meaning influences thinking. Thinking affects living. So, again, consider the historical situation. Okay? Like I said, consider the historical situation. Keep in mind progressive revelation. Because the new covenant had not been fully revealed. It was only promised as at the Old Testament. Do you see that? But you are looking at the place of the law. It came in with Moses 400 years after Abraham. And about 1,300 years before Christ. That's the law for you. But when reading the New Testament, you're going to find out that, for instance, Matthew shows us a dimension of Christ. I think it was in the book of Matthew that even reveals Christ as king. All right? Matthew reveals Christ as what? King. As king. So, you need to understand that Matthew reveals Jesus Christ as what? The Messianic King. But Mark does not reveal Jesus Christ as King. He reveals Jesus Christ as Son. Mark should reveal. The theme of Mark should be Jesus Christ as the Servant Son. You see that? Now, Luke does not reveal Jesus as the Servant Son as, in, as a theme now. He reveals Jesus as the divine human savior. Are you seeing? Matthew is what king? Mark is son. Luke is savior. Divine human savior. What about John? John reveals Jesus as the son of God. 
So Matthew reveals Jesus as king. Mark as what? As what? Luke as... You weren't writing it down when I was saying. Matthew reveals Jesus as king. He shows that, you know, that kingly dimension of the Christ. Mark does not reveal Jesus as king. The theme of Mark is Jesus the servant son. Notice the expression. It's different from Luke. Mark is what? Servant son. Luke is divine human savior. John is the son of God. Not servant son now. But what? The son of God. Are you with me now? So, the book of John, you know, tells us what Jesus said and what he did. And what he meant by what he said. Acts shows us church history. The first church, all right? The first church, the church at the infancy, you know, how we began. The epistles, you're going to see all kinds of things written in the epistles. One, the epistles was written, you know, to answer questions, all right? Deal with issues that were arising in the church, all right? Problems that arose among the people and bringing apostolic wisdom, all right? And balance to God's people. That's what you find out there. The book of Revelation, for instance, what you are going to see. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what the Bible calls the Gospels. All right, what we call the Gospels. You know, then the, the rest that follows is what? The Epistles. Acts is an historical book, okay? Then we have the Epistles. All right, Pauline, Revelation, and all that. Then Revelation. The book of Revelation is actually it is, is a prophetic book. It contains mostly visions all right and symbols you see a lot of symbols a wheel within a within a wheel you see all kinds of symbols there all right it's a very prophetic uh book and it takes the spirit of god to really guide us but there is also in my book uh, contending for the faith i think or the last days I taught there on approaches to interpreting the book of Revelation. There are about four to five, you know, approaches to interpreting the book of Revelation. You have the preterist view, all right? There are, there is the preterist view of interpreting the book of Revelation. There are different views. There are about four views actually, um, generally accepted in interpreting the book of Revelation. But that's not um, our focus. So, I'm not going to go into into all that. But the theme of the book of Revelation is the kingdom of God. In conflict and the consummation, all right, the end of all things, and you know, a new beginning. So that's how that what we see in the book of Revelation. Let's leave that. Um, so keep in mind, all right, like I said, ancient culture, okay, the customs, the cultures, the age, the time at which those things were happening, and why they did what they did. Keep in mind also to whom the book was written, who was the book written to, all right, and their particular situation. James was is a Jewish epistle. It was written to the Jews. Most of Paul's epistles were to answer questions and to bring apostolic wisdom. John's epistles was to deal with the effects of Gnostic, Gnosticism. Gnostics. Alright? Gnostics have their own belief. Buddhists have their own belief. Alright? They are different. Alright? Secular humanism and all that. Addressing different issues. Jude. Alright? The goal was to contend for the faith debunking all those lascivious meanness and you know overstretching the message of grace in a bit to prove that um you know promiscuity and all that something there's no resurrection things like that the book of hebrews for instance addresses discouraged christians okay who were beginning to doubt the essential truths and the fundamentals of the gospel Another thing to consider, number one, I said consider the historical situation, all right? Number two, major thing again to consider is the type of literature, all right? And then I said, for example, we have poetry, okay? On that poetry, you're going to be seeing things like, you know, the Songs of Solomon, okay? All right, you're going to see, you know, Psalms, okay? Proverbs and things like that. Number two, you are going to see historical books, you look at 1st Samuel and 2nd Samuel, historical books, 1st Kings and 2nd Kings, 1st Chronicles and 2nd Chronicles. Some of you, I know you get bored when you read Matthew chapter 1 and then begin to talk about the genealogy of Jesus. And you say, what is all these names and of all past, be your builder and build that, be that. You say, oh, oh God, oh, tell us, read us. 
historical books okay number three apocalyptic books apocalyptic some parts of the book of daniel all right are apocalyptic apocalypsis okay from the word apocalypsis it's actually the unveiling of revelation okay apocalyptic book zechariah is an apocalyptic book and of course you know the book of revelation is an apocalyptic book number four we have what we call parables right if you look at parables you see parables in scripture a lot of parables but especially if you see matthew 13 okay parables and the goal of parables is what to illustrate basic truths sometimes it can even be just one basic truth just to give a parable to summarize it but also we can bring 500 <laughs> but parables are to illustrate basic truths okay you know bring into day-to-day life all right for instance now let's say um i want to talk about how that you know christians should ignite others and then i say okay i want to tell you the parable of the matches and the matchstick and then i said okay the matches you know you light the matches and then as it touches the other ones what happens and then i put one or two stories to you say that's a parable so the goal was to just let you know that the emphasis the basic truth there should be christians ought to you know carry fire and light others all right like a torch so that's what parable is number five is what wisdom books that's where we have the proverbs you know proverbs has 31 chapters in fact i do advise people read a chapter per day 31 chapters that's most months all right you're able to read a chapter okay one chapter per day apart from other readings that you may be doing it helps you it helps you see some you know important lessons ecclesiastics too ecclesiastes is, is it's a wisdom book ecclesiastes is a is a wisdom book and then you know we have epistles this is epistles seven prophetic books so you see the epistles that's number six epistles okay you, you know what the epistles are after acts what you have there is what epistles romans corinthians galatians ephesians okay then number seven we have prophetic books like i've said so consider you know all right the context of the word how it is used in other contexts avoid bringing your assumption all right to the reading of the word don't come with assumption you know don't assume okay so let me give you some practical helps so that we we'll just wrap up uh, this so that i don't extend it to part, f- part <laughs> three and four and five are you being blessed you have been blessed amen. amen all right so let's do practical helps i've already shared some of them before so i'm just going to recap you know on them get a bible dictionary get a bible handbook bible commentaries can help you why so that you can get the language right, the meaning right, the interpretation right, and the application right. Okay? Read and compare several translations. Some of you have come inside before and you will see that I have like four, six, seven Bibles sometimes on my table. You know what I'm trying to do? I'm comparing, all right, interpretations. I'm comparing translations so that I can get the best, I can get the juice out of that verse. Aim for the most natural meaning considering the type of literature you happen to be reading aim for the most natural meaning don't start by trying to be spooky about something okay when you find meaning that's when your mind is relieved in fact Spart- um, charles Spurgeon said if a text gets a hold of you charles had on Spurgeon, ch Spurgeon. he says if a text gets a hold on you Chances are that you got a hold of it. Because when you find meaning, your, your, your mind is relieved and your heart is gripped. Martin Luther said the best way to understand Romans 8 is to see its flow after reading Romans chapter 1 to 7. So that means don't just pick a chapter and say, oh, because of that chapter, I want to start from the beginning of that chapter. Sometimes you can even start from chapter 1. So that you can see, all right, the flow. For instance, if you, you know, yes, we divide the Bible in chapters so that it can help us, you know, we can understand how to quote it and all that and to cite it. Really, if you look at the scriptures properly, you are going to find out that some chapters flow to the next chapter. Some ended with command and then continues in the next line while you're still talking. Do you see that? Are you with me? Yes. So, so that's that's very key. 
the first task of exegesis is what? A careful study. Remember what I defined exegesis to be? What did I define exegesis to be? Exegesis is what? Bringing out the basic meaning of a text. Okay. So, exegesis. The first task of exegesis is careful study of a text within its context to discover its original intended meaning. You get it? A text within the context to discover the original intended meaning. Not our cultural meaning. Not what they said. Not what the elder said. What the Bible says. Are we together? Mm. That's the first task of exegesis. Careful study of a text within its context. There's something we call pretext. Pretext is presumption. Is bringing your own preconceived notion and bringing it into the word of God. That's what we call pretext. Don't allow it. Don't encourage it. Alright? A text outside its context is called pretext. G. Campbell, Mother, uh, G. Campbell Morgan spoke about. He said a text outside its context is called pretext. That's, you are take, that's not what he's saying, but you are taking it out of it to mean what you want it to. Alright? Beware of isogesis. Isogesis. I-S-O-G-E-S-I-S. -S. It means putting a meaning that was never intended. Alright? You know, and, and you see this a lot. Especially when a minister doesn't study scriptures well. Well, we can forgive ourselves. You know, at different times, we can just bring a scripture in the name of a uh, king and just quote and say. But really, if you really want to be accurate, uh, you have to avoid these things. Putting a meaning that was never intended. If it's your own meaning, just say, yeah, this one is just me that I say need to not... That's not what that verse is saying. Or don't quote the scripture for it. Just say what you feel like saying. You get. Don't say it's the scripture. Don't say what you feel like saying and then now try to back it up with scripture. Let the scripture be the soul, the foundation for what you want to say. You get. Mm. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Having found what you believe to be the intended meaning, then now ask, what does this mean to me? All right? Prayerfully, Lord, what does this mean to me? How can I apply this? Are you saying something to me through this? How can I be guided? Is there something to do? Lord, help me. Open my understanding. All right? Number four, you know, number three was the practical helps. Number one was historical situation. Number two was type of, consider the type of literature. Number three is practical helps. Number four is questions. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him what? Ask. The God who you are asking from, he means there is no variableness or shadow of turning. He will answer you, he will help you. That's what James said. Questions, ask questions. There are so many people who study their Bible, they never ask questions. They just say, How oh, was your Bible? Say, oh, I read it. And then they've forgotten what they read. Me, I ask questions a lot too. Hey, there are some questions if I ask you, eh? <laughs> you may be wondering, Are you a believer? Yes, I'm a believer. You have to ask questions, it helps you to grow. You have to probe some of the things you believe so that you can get deeper. If it is right, you get deeper. If it is wrong, you ignore it. Are you with me? Is the teaching of scripture true because it is in the Bible? Is it in the Bible because it is true? You see that? Is it possible to arrive at the knowledge of the truth even if it is not in the Bible? R.T. Kendall, you know, in his book, uh, Understanding Theology, these were the questions. Is it possible to arrive at an accurate knowledge ignoring the Bible? But this is how it works. Those who truly seek the Lord would be would would all heartedly look for Him in His Word, because the Bible says, you know, we've said that the Bible reveals God to us. He reveals His mind to us, His nature and His character. So every time you are seeking Him in the Word, you are you are not doing it because you want to prove to a neighbor. No, you are doing it because you want to know Him. So when people cry out in church, "Oh God, I want to know You," it's not enough to cry. I want to know You and cry. After the tears, carry your Bible. That's the proof that what you know, you want to know. Him. Number five, broaden your perspective. Some passages are explicitly doctrinal. That's, that's, for instance, the book of Romans, doctrine. Ephesians, doctrine. Galatians, doctrine. Some passages are pastoral, you know, epistles. Timothy is a pastoral epistle. The book of Titus, pastoral epistle. So broaden your perspective, okay? Do research. Find out. Number six, Avoid, you know, I've said this over and over and I can't overemphasize it. Avoid quoting a verse out of its context 
unless you apply it as was originally intended. Don't quote a verse out of its context. Are we together? Yes, sir. Somebody learning something. Yes, let, should I give you an example of what I'm talking about? Let, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Give me 1 Timothy 5.23 and somebody else, Titus, um, Titus 1.12. 1 Timothy 5.23, please. Drink no longer water, <laughs> but use a little wine for thy stomach sake. Now, and I often... Now, somebody who doesn't take time to calm down and read the scripture well, he just sees, drink no longer water and stops there. You know what that means? You know what that will do to the person? The person will die young now. Right? That means you will say no. Even my Bible, my Bible says that. Because every jot of it is the word of God. Drink no longer water. Hallelujah. No. Bible didn't say. No. You are not with me. You are, not, are you with me? Drink no longer water. And then we say the Bible, a new doctrine. Don't drink water again. Because the Bible said it. But you didn't read the whole place. You see that now? <laughs> That's taking a verse out of his context. Titus 1 12, please. Can I hear you well, please? One yeah. of them, a prophet of their own said, a prophet, prophet of their own said. Cretans are always liars. Even, even beasts. Lazy Did you? Now, imagine you were a Cretan. You were from Crete. And you read this. Eh? Yes. How will you feel? Eh? <laughs> he said, Cretans are always liars. liars. So that means if you are from Crete, well, if you are hearing me, are your friends from Crete? Uh, well, do not be offended. Well, who knows whether? Okay, but <laughs> now that's taking the verse out of context. Do you see that? Are Cretans always liars? No. Are they evil beasts? No. Are they slow bellies? No. People won't read. You know, in context, you just say that means everybody's. First Corinthians seven thirty-eight, for instance. Let, let me just show you one more so that. As we prepare to pray. Are you being blessed already? Yes. First Corinthians, please. 738. So then, uh-huh. he who gives her in marriage does well. Uh-huh. For he who does not give her in marriage does, does better. Do you know what that means? No. Read it again. So then, <laughs> he who gives her in marriage mm-hmm. does well. But he who does not give her in marriage does better. So that means... so. So, if you want to take it literally and don't and don't want to follow context, what will you say? You will advise the father of that child sh- not to allow the daughter to get married. So, also then, Amplified Version says, He, the father who gives his virgin daughter in marriage, does well. And he, the father who does not give her in marriage, he even does better. So, who will marry her? Are you learning? So, this is how people take it out of it. Because it's the word of God. That's what the Bible says. It's my Bible. That, oh, God. I don't know if your eyes are being opened to number seven. Avoid, I said this in part one anyway. Avoid abracadabra Bible reading. Abracadabra is just open and say, eh, anywhere I open, anywhere I open, please <laughs> don't let the devil cheat you. Anywhere I open, anywhere I open. Expecting sudden, quick, infallible guidance by randomly opening scripture is not encouraged and is not to be encouraged. Okay? Don't say mini mini mani mo me any mini mani mo and then you just open zoom and then you open hmm, I'm not that let me not say the Deuteronomy 28 and you open somewhere in the sand where the person said I I my soul is going to shield now I say hey oh god all right so verse number eight let's stop at number eight uh, I think with that that should equip you enough number eight trust the Holy Spirit. Please, I want to give you an assignment tonight. One of the assignments is please read John chapter 14, okay? Chapter 15 and chapter 16. John 14, 15 and 16. Okay? Trust the Holy Spirit. Somebody say with me, trust. Trust. The Holy Spirit. Why? You have to be in good terms with him because he is the author of scripture. John chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16. 
all right take time to please read it and meditate on it jesus spoke a lot you know about him about the comforter who will abide with us forever okay he's going to show us or if you see john 14 26 you will see it there you know it will teach you all things bring to your remembrance the things that i've said unto you john 14 17 is the spirit of truth and why is he called the spirit of truth because he's the spirit of jesus who is the truth he testifies to the truth he enlightens concerning the truth john 16 13 okay so this, this is why the holy spirit all right came teaches us and guides us in all the will of god he bridges the gap between history and experience he bridges intellectual gap there are people who are not even very you know cerebral sort of or very you know educated but because they know the holy spirit they have deep understanding of the bible have you met people like that yes. you see that so your experiences are not greater than the holy spirit the harder you work to understand the word of god giving yourself giving your best giving your time giving your resources the more the holy spirit will work in the end to clarify the meaning to you and also help you to fulfill your purpose in god as a believer if you have been helped say i have been helped now shall we go to the lord in prayer we're spending at least five minutes in prayer tonight and can you thank him for the ministry of his word and thank him for his grace that he has given to us in this season to be partakers of his word and that lord god we receive grace we receive grace to not just be hearers of your word but to go on to be doers of your word to follow on to be doers of your word make us doers of your word help us lord as we choose to practice we know that growth takes time but we receive grace to remain consistent in the name of jesus because the goal of god is not that we grow fast actually he's also that we go strong we grow roots lord we receive grace to be grounded in truth we receive grace that your word dwells with in us richly in all wisdom and spiritual understanding Lord God, cause enlightenment. Let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, bringing us into understanding of the reality of the new creation, of our identity in you, of your will, your purpose, your counsel for our lives, and how that we can meet your needs, O God, and please you in our daily lives, O God. We receive grace to be doers of your word, to be students of your word, students for life, learning your word, doing your word, applying your word in the name of Jesus. Kuda bahas kida bantraska levinambo so teke bati raska pale mahankra sail de kopa ol me korda baldi vista revaski akratolin graska pati orebo kampi zalikus katinas ravinas evinahande musterion datas kapura agras lahakritas kame munde kovish adubila adubila baraski krus agragadam prash lafana mahade liko posale Barakizga, Tvras, Afras, Fanaskina, Bahane, Uramamane, Kabaliskati, Fulabashana, Mahaskide. We receive grace, Jesus, to be doer. Can we ask God that, Lord, your word we have heard tonight will not stand against us, but rather will be an equipping tool for us. We will become better because of it, and we will become kingdom ambassadors who will learn, who will practice, who will do, and also disciple others in the way. In the name of Jesus. Rabahaska, can we pray for uncommon appetite in the word as we feed on the word our hunger for the word increases increases this season in the name of jesus the word delivers us from deception in the last days bahaski robaante talavaso Fune komanate suna marakaba o labari kaski pa proseleki krahava bradis kabradis that in the end you will rejoice over us you will rejoice over us you will rejoice over us as a result of the profitability of the power and the potency of your word at work in our souls in the name of Jesus we choose the way of the Lord for the way of the Lord is the way of wisdom is the way of power rahaski baba la kamonasa zidas Oh, give him thanks now. Give him thanks now. Father, we are grateful to you. We give you praise. We adore you. 
We celebrate your faithfulness. Thank you for my friends who have listened to your word tonight. We receive grace to be doers, to practicalize and see results. Blessed be your holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We reject every form of distraction and indiscipline. We, dis- we receive grace to be disciplined. Disciplined students of the word. We wake when we need to wake. We study when we need to study. We apply when we need to apply. And Jesus is glorified. The brethren are edified. And we become salt and light to a, a dying world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.